this long labour of love will finally take to the air. They're hoping that will happen within the next few months. Yes. Gordon, BBC News, East Lothian. Now on BBC News, our world expelled from Uganda. Can you see yourself leaving that house? And do you remember what you did as you left? You okay. were scared. 50 years ago, my family fled their home in Uganda. All Asian with the British citizen must leave Uganda. President Idi Amin gave Ugandan Asians 90 days to leave. The army people said, just get quickly inside the car. Most people took the bare minimum, a suitcase and a tiny amount of cash. My mom was just saying, take the money out, throw it away. Oh, mom, it's money. No, just throw it now. She must have left a lot behind. She did. We literally took nothing at all. I grew up hearing stories of a tropical paradise. But towards the end of their time there, my family's reality was very different. I must reorganize this country properly. Now I'm going there with my mum and my aunt to understand more about what they lost. Hello, Mama. And how the expulsion impacted the country. You asking us questions there, but you did them when you see how people run. Uganda. <laughs> they brought it with them. You'd put gas in here. Yeah. And then you'd what turn? Bit of in. Bit of power and gas. Yeah. I'm Reha, a reporter for the BBC, and I'm looking into my family history. What was your favourite thing to do at home? At home, favourite things. Actually, if you like, ask me, cooking. from Uganda, we brought it with us. Look, it's quite a lot, but I don't show you all of them. My family comes from Uganda. They were expelled there in 1972 and moved here into the UK as refugees. I'm going back with my mum and my aunt, all three of us for the first time, to see where they lived, where they grew up, and basically take it all in and, and live through them. What's the goal? In Mohili, Mogo. Mogo. So much of the language, the Gujarati that we speak at home is influenced by Swahili. So much of the food we eat is very authentically Ugandan Indian or East African Indian. It's very good and good for the INA as well. I definitely feel Ugandan. Yes, I was born there. I am Ugandan. We used to learn how to ride a bike over there. The fruits over there is lovely. And yes, we had good fun, all of us. My grandparents, very old photo. My nana, my grandfather, he moved to Uganda from India pre-partition. He moved firstly by himself. And then a few years later, my nanny ma, my grandmother, uh, my Masi, and my mama, my oldest uncle, moved along with him. <laughs> this is a very cool photo. This is my granddad and my nana. That's my eldest uncle and my other uncles. I'm yeah. Lily Masi. <laughs> Look how pretty I was. <laughs> so pretty. <laughs> this is me. This is our house in Jinja, and I forgot to tell you that one day, all the elders had gone to see a film. It was just me and Hausa Masi, and they had started shooting right at the uh, at everybody's houses, you know, where we were staying in Jinja, and okay, we had to hide yeah. under the, the table. In August 1972, President Idi Amin said God came to him in a dream and told him to expel all Asians from the country. Their main interest has been to exploit the economy of Uganda. We feel bad, very badly shocked. Like, you know, what we are going to do it. For the 80,000 strong population, his dream became a nightmare. General Amin has promised he'll make those ignoring the ultimatum feel as though they're sitting on fire. I 
was at home when I heard that uh, my dad and my brother said to us that uh, we have to pack our things and uh, go as we cannot stay in Uganda anymore now. The British High Commission passport office here has been besieged by hundreds and hundreds of Asians holding British passports. Sixteen members of my family took the journey from Entebbe Airport to the UK. So we had to have two cars and we had uh, Abote's army people take us to Entebbe Airport. They escorted us. Oh, I, I, I definitely felt something was wrong. Why would an army person sort of escort us to, to Entebbe, you know, to come to London? I think we, Uganda will benefit more if Asian are out of Uganda. My family lived in a bubble in their own echo chamber. They were surrounded mostly by brown people. The dynamic between brown people and black people mostly where they lived was that of worker and boss. There's always been this hierarchy, white people at the top, brown people in the middle, and black people at the bottom. And this has existed in Uganda under the British. I personally felt that people in Uganda, uh, Asians and Ugandans, were mixing quite well together. So much of what they tell me is wrapped around nostalgia, and I really want to dig deeper than that and find out what life was like there for them and why they had to leave. I'm going to Uganda and I'm really, really excited. I'm looking forward to meeting all all the people, Ugandans over there. I'm looking forward to going and seeing the house that I was born in and the house in Jinja that we were living in the last. What was really emotional for me was seeing my mum and my aunt. They bagelagd, which means they paid their respects in a very Hindu way, which you usually do to the feet of elders. It was a really surreal and very lovely moment to witness because I have never seen them do that before. I'm looking to see our house in Kakira. That's where I was born. I want to go inside. I want to see what it's like. And yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. I want to remember everything that was when I was young. Do you think when you're there, you'll unlock more memories that you can't remember? Uh, yes, I think so. Let's see. Let's get over there and let's see what I remember and what I don't. Yeah. What's what changed? Is, what what was there when before? We, when we live here, it wasn't anything this old like that. But what was this place before? It was completely plain and so nice and greenery there. Yeah. But now it was a com that's why I, I soaked, you know. And first I feel like, you know. What? What's this? Very, what it comes feeling? like a feeling like, you know, start to cry like, you mm -hmm. know. Why are you feeling like crying? Yeah, because they build up so nicely, but still, you know, it's not the same. It's not the same at all. Alright, we're, yeah. we're entering Kakira. Okay. This is Kakira. Kakira is an estate. It's owned by the Madhavani family. This is where they produce sugarcane, where they plant sugarcane. Essentially, Kakira is a town within itself. And everyone who works for the Madhavani family lives in Kakira. My grandfather, Basanjujuk Jeevan Rajdev, arrived in Uganda sometime in the late 1920s. He lived and worked here. Don't say hi to the camera. Come hi. Hi, Kamira. The Madhvani family left just before the expulsion, as tensions started to brew. Hi. But like many Ugandan Asians, they were invited back by the government in the 80s to help rebuild the economy. <laughs> we're, we're actually very, very happy that you got your Madhvani's, uh, you know, factories and everything back. So when we came back, the policy was to assist the private sector. And why did you decide to come back to Kakira? 
more emotional at that time. There was absolutely no hope for the country. But we're Ugandans. See, I was born here. So, you know, it, it's like a magnet pulls you. What happened was it started off as an emotional trip and then it became a commercial trip. The government policy was that we took away the assets from the Asians, all the properties belonging to Asians should be given back. And you know, I think what, what lacked before with the Asians was they didn't do enough for the community. I mean, some people would argue that Indians benefited from this colonial structure that was put in place that had Indians as the middlemen. But you would also say that we've moved beyond that? Oh, yes. I think that's all over. I mean, you, you, you just have to look at young Ugandans. Their aspirations, their wants are very much similar to what you want in London. In 1961, Uganda gained independence from the British. And black Ugandans were able to put their needs first. No. I've come to meet Joel, who was here at the time of the expulsion. This is my show. So if we were talking about this sort of alley before the expulsion in 1972, would it be locals um, owning shops here or would it be Indians? No, they were Indians. Since the return of Asians to Uganda, communities are more integrated, but some subtle tensions still exist. Do you see Indians who live here as Ugandan as well? Yeah, why not? Why not? And that's why some of these people came back. In Uganda, are Indians considered closer to whiteness or are they considered white? Closer to the whites, yeah. And in fact, most, most of them like it that way. <laughs> the Asians tend to look at us as either beggars, you know, like people who don't have anything. So you feel that still exists today? It does, yeah. Oh, yes, it does. It does. So why did the expulsion happen? Why were Ugandan Asians blamed? Indians have been in East Africa since the 15th century. Many were traders who settled in the region. But with the arrival of the British Empire, their role changed. They were uh, all victims of colonialism themselves. They were brought as indentured laborers to work on the railway, cheap uh, laborers. They were uh, put in that place to be used. So the British dividing their different subjects. Indians were restricted or were promoted or were confined to the commercial sector, not the agriculture, because they were even not allowed to have land. So some Africans felt that they, they, they were, it was not a leveled ground, that these investors were having undue preference, the government preference through policies. When Idi Amin became president in 1971, change came for everyone. Some Africans, uh, uh, so it has an opportunity to reverse that order. <laughs> there were two sets of victims, each one going in a different trajectory. The Asian have been milking Uganda's money. There isn't much literature around the expulsion and Ugandan Indian history, so I've come to the Uganda Society Library to see what I can find and how much I can find. I found Idi Amin's speech the weekend of the 12th and 13th of August in which he explains why he expelled uh, Asians, Ugandan Asians, and his opening paragraph reads, no country can tolerate the economy of a nation being so much in the hands of non-citizens as is the case in Uganda today. No government can tolerate foreigners like Asians in Uganda sabotaging the economy of the country and engaging in numerous forms of corruption. It's as though he's playing on the insecurities of locals, of Ugandans who felt already that there were hostilities and tensions arising. Already the 15 British immigration staff in the passport office look 
likely to be swamped as the pressure mounts and the anxieties of the Asians are being increased as they're meeting delay, confusion, indecision or fear of something worse. We're off to meet someone who means a lot to my mum and my aunt. They haven't seen each other in over 50 years. Khadija used to work for a family friend of ours and we got to know her very, very well. I think she started working with them when she was about 14, 15 years old. Yes, she, she was, was very young, young, but absolutely lovely girl. She, she learned how to cook Indian food and everything and she's a really wonderful person. Maybe I shouldn't hold her hand. Hello. Hello. Hello, Mama. Hello. Namanagani. Namanagani, Mazuri. 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 Who am I? Lady. Oh, yes. Now we know. Now we know, Kariza. Do you know who I am? Yes. Yes. Do you know who I am? It was very warming to see my mum and my auntie and Khadija meet and just relive their younger years. They, it, it's like they all became kids again. And do you remember I used to, to come to your house to teach the girls all the, you know, the dancing and everything and I go stay there. Garba. Yeah. Garba, Garba, see, see, remember. <laughs> what was really interesting talking to Khadija was understanding the impact the expulsion and Idi Amin's government had on her life. She was beaten. Okay. Yes, they, they, the soldiers came and they said, Babla Kaka, she's the one who kept the money. So she was beaten because oh my God. they wanted the money. The black Ugandan population were often targeted by Amin soldiers and human rights violations committed against them have been well documented. If you are inside the house, they come for you. Mm. One week, she was sleeping with a kid in the bush. Oh. At the age of one week, the kid was one week. Oh. Police from Jinja came uh -huh. in the 99 yeah. uh -huh. to Kakira to look for her. Oh my God. Oh. Yeah. It was really quite graphic and really heartbreaking to hear. And I think that's, that's what we tend to miss a lot when we talk about the expulsion or the expulsion under Idi Amin, is the impact that it had on the local population. <laughs> well, it's good to see that she's not in a bad situation at all. She's living in a good place. She's got a nice house. She's got nice uh, environment and everything. But it's sad to know what happened to her after we Asians left. Lilina, Lilina. <laughs> what the army had done to her and everything. It was sad to know that. Okay, Kariza, bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank you, my dear. So nice to see you. Our last stop is Ginger, where my family lived before they fled the country. It's also where most of mum's memories are, good and bad. Yeah. To go to see Junior House was exciting because uh, I felt that I'm going to go and see everything in there exactly the same as it was and be able to visualise my family there. We got to the house and we were quite profusely knocking on the door until someone came and very hospitably let us in without any questions. Close your eyes, close your eyes, close your eyes. All right, I'm gonna lead you in, keep them closed. You know, you have this excitement building up and my mom is okay. walking okay. through. Wow, sitting room. Yeah, yes, sitting room, room, yes. And then all of a sudden the mood changes and she's very confused, she can't remember the layout of the house being like this. This wasn't there. No, because the toilet. And this was my mom and dad's room. Over here. Do you want to check if that? Do you mind? It's closed. Okay. It was hard to sort of walk in and it's completely changed except for one room, which was my mom and dad's room. And that was locked. And that wasn't really nice because I couldn't see it. And I was expecting to see that too. I don't know. I felt that my mom and dad would be there. 
what I wasn't prepared for was my mum's confusion and sadness. Um, it was a lot. <laughs> um, sorry. <laughs> This was a shower in the bathroom. It was, it was emotional for me to sort of not see in there and I had to walk out of there. Yeah. It was here, the car was somewhere right here. Yeah. Right? So, so it's very sad that we can't see my mom and dad's room because that was the one that was very, very important to me. Because uh, I've lost my mom and dad and uh, this house has actually broken me up. Like I've been really, like yes, I've, 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 I've been very strong up yeah. till now, but seeing this house, it, it really broke me. It really broke me. Your attachment to Nana and Nanima was here? Yes, it was. Is that why you were crying? Well, in a way, yes. Uh, I mean, we enjoyed ourselves so much over here in this house. It's, it's painful that you're with me, and I can't even explain to you what it was like. Until I came here and visualised my mum and my aunt's last days in Uganda, I hadn't really understood how complex their time here had become. Can you see yourself leaving that house and do you remember what you did as you left? The army people said just get quickly inside the car. They were checking each individual. My mum was the first one to go inside and she came back and said take the money out, put it outside the window now. We literally took nothing at all except for our clothes and that's all we had. Even those clothes were not suitable for, uh, for England. One of the few things they took with them was a picture from their temple. See, her Samasi got a photograph in her room. Nanima actually did take that, that picture saying that I'm taking you out from the temple and taking it to wherever I'm going, basically. And she prayed over there, you know, to keep us safe. This picture doesn't just symbolise their struggles to get to the UK, but also their resilience to resettle in an unfamiliar place. Maybe it was much bigger. First, they left India for Uganda. Then Uganda for the UK. Hopefully now they feel they belong. We've got some big weather contrasts around on Saturday, which of course is New Year's Eve. Now for England and Wales it's going to be a mild day, but there'll be some heavy rain around, colder air across northern areas, and in Scotland that will bring some snow. So very different air masses across the country at the moment. Strong southwesterly winds bringing the mild air across England and Wales, but the colder air in Scotland will continue to bring some snow showers in here. So. Weather-wise, next few hours, risk of some icy stretches in Scotland. Could see a few centimetres of snow building in over the hills here in places. Further southwards, we've got this uh, area of rain around across England and Wales. But look at these temperatures as we head into the early morning on uh, New Year's Eve. 10, 11, 12 degrees Celsius. Very, very mild indeed. And through the rest of Saturday, it's going to stay mild across England and Wales. There will be more rain coming and going. Now, the ground saturated across the south of England and Wales, and this rain could actually lead to some areas of localised surface water flooding. Very mild, 12 to 14 degrees in places through the afternoon, but the colder air in Scotland, where there will be some places that struggle to see temperatures much above freezing. Now, running closer to those New Year celebrations at midnight, Hogmanay, of course, we've got this area of rain extending across Northern Ireland, Northern England, showers following to the south, where it stays quite breezy and mild, now, as this rain band starts to move into the colder air in Scotland, we might actually start to see it turn to snow. There is quite a bit of uncertainty about this one, but we could see some heavy snow, not just affecting some of the hillier areas, but maybe also getting down to some lower levels. As I say, there is a degree of uncertainty in that kind of forecast, but stay in touch with the weather. 
if you live in Scotland and you're worried about those snowy conditions heading into uh, New Year's Day. New Year's Day itself, it stays quite cold in Scotland. Any snow will slowly begin to fizzle in intensity. Further southwards, we've got the mild air with us again. Uh, still a few showers around, but those temperatures, 12 to 13 degrees Celsius, that's still around 5 Celsius above the December average. Now, beyond that, generally, those southwesterly winds will continue to blow across much of the UK well into the start of the new year. So it's going to be quite cloudy at times without breaks of rain, quite breezy, but on the whole, staying on the mild side. Bye bye.